Welcome to today's webinar, Taxes Be Gone, Charitable Tax Strategies in Estate Planning. I am Jim Cunningham, your uh, speaker today, and we're going to go through some tried and true, uh, really exciting tax strategies where many of our clients have been able to save, uh, frankly, lots of money on, on taxes and, and help out the causes that, that people care about. So this is a disclaimer. This is very, very important. I'm a lawyer. I'm talking. Uh, my lips are moving. Uh, this is not legal advice. This is pure information. So don't go run out and do a whole bunch of stuff thinking this is legal advice. We have an excellent team of lawyers here. We have seven lawyers in our firm. I'm off to the left there. We have offices in Southern California in the Los Angeles area, Orange County, the Sacramento region, and uh, the Bay Area in, in California as well. So today we're going to talk about the benefits of charitable tax planning. And there have been a lot of changes in the law in 2020. Uh, mainly that you can now deduct up to 100% of your income in taxes. Uh, and that's just for 2020 under the CARES Act. And that's for cash-based assets. So if you make $100,000 and you give $100,000 to charity, that takes your, um, uh, takes your income down to zero. Many are unaware of the tax advantages of mindful charitable giving. You know, a lot of people give to their church, they give to their charity, they give to their synagogue, whatever it is. A lot of people just don't know that there are better ways to do it. And we're going to talk about those better ways. And these savvy strategies, frankly, can pay you a lifetime of income. They can benefit your family and the charity and work for your heirs as well. So a lot of cool stuff in there. We're going to go through some pros and cons of various forms of charitable trusts. There is a Q&A. Uh, if you're watching this recording, obviously it's a recording, there's no Q&A, but we do have a Q&A button up there um, on the Zoom uh, bar. So if you have a question, go ahead and put that in there and I will try and get you, um, try and answer your question. So here's how we at Cunningham Legal help you and your loved ones. You know, as a taxpayer, you want to pay the legal minimum in taxes and not a penny more. And we're, help, we're here to help you craft a plan and give you options, make recommendations that reduce your tax bill, leading to more wealth for your loved ones and the causes that you care about. So net positive all around. I'm going to use this example because I think this is one of the more common examples we see with clients. So a client may have bought a fourplex in 1990 or, soon, or earlier, right, uh, for 500000 That fourplex is now worth $2 million. And clients, frankly, you know, if you've had something for 30 years, uh, you're tired of leaky faucets, you're tired of plugged up toilets, and frankly, tenants who don't pay their rent on time, or maybe not at all, uh, and the property's fully depreciated. So if you're a real estate investor, you know what that is. Basically, the government says, this building that you bought that people are living in, we're going to pretend that the whole structure collapses in 30 or 40 years, depending on if it's residential or commercial. And we're going to give you a tax break every year. Well, that reduces your cost basis, and we'll see how that affects things. So something to be aware of is that gains on sales, if you buy something for 500000 and you sell it for $2 million, that's a gain. And those gains in the United States are subject to capital gains tax. It's a different tax than income tax on the federal level. On the state level, in California at least, there is no capital gains tax. It is all income tax. So California does not make a distinction between capital gains and income. It's all the same rate. So in this example, at the sale, the gain, they paid, that this person paid 500,000 for it. Now it's worth 2 million and they sell it, but look at the gain is 1.9 million. And you might be saying, now, wait a minute. If I bought it for 500,000 and I sell it for 2 million, shouldn't that be a $1.5 million gain? Uh, but the reality is, depreciation comes back in. So um, I'm, I'm gonna go through here this example, a $2 million sales price, the, um, the taxes that are paid on a sale. So Bob and Sue own this property. We're gonna use them as an example in a couple of slides. Bob and Sue sell this property for two and a half million dollars. Here's the tax bill. $100,000 goes to the feds. That's recapture of depreciation. 300,000 in federal capital gains tax. $57,000 in net investment income tax and $252,700 in California tax. These are the highest rates, okay? So I'm, I'm presuming that they have other assets or they're selling other things. So the maximum that's paid is, is just over $700,000 in total tax. That is an effective rate of 35%. What does an effective rate mean? Well, it means if you kind of add up all those taxes and take a broad view of it, uh, a more than third, a third of the gains on this property 
are being paid in tax, and that leaves uh, Bob and Sue with just under 1.3 million. So the types of tax that exist in the United States today uh, are these taxes. The federal generation skipping transfer tax is the highest tax. It is 64%. Basically, if you leave a whole bunch of money to your grandkids, uh, you potentially can pay a 64% death tax or gift tax. The federal estate tax and gift tax is at 40%. That's on amounts over currently for 2020, $11,580,000. That is jumping to $11,700,000 um, in 2021. The federal income tax rate is up to 37%. We don't know when Biden's sworn in as president if that'll go up. Uh, probably won't go down. It might go up to 39.6%. We just don't know. And then there's the federal recapture of depreciation tax, and that's up to 25%. The capital gains tax is at 20%, California state income tax 13.8, and uh, the net investment income tax 3.8. Why am I going through all of this? Because what we're going to be talking about are the bottom five taxes here, okay? Those are the ones that are relevant when our clients are selling these properties. So if we add all these up, if you're living in California or you don't live in California, but you sell property in California, okay, you're going to be subject to these taxes. And there is no more federal deduction for state income tax paid. And so what we end up with is we just add up all these together. And if you are um, selling a property, your recapture of depreciation. So in our case, that $2 million property that was depreciated from 500,000 to 100,000, that 400,000 is taxed at 42.6%. That's the maximum rate. And the whole point of this, going through this, is something you need to know. The capital gains taxes are not only 20%. I talk with a lot of clients and they say, Jim, yeah, capital gains taxes, well, sometimes they're 15, sometimes they're 20. Well, yeah, for federal, but there are all these other taxes that you have to be mindful of, especially if you're in California. And these are bracketed rates. What that means is the more gain you have, the higher percentage each dollar pays in tax. And these are the maximum tax rates. Um, so can you, question is, can you explain what recapture is? So recapture of depreciation is when, um, in this example, the $500,000 uh, property, your investment property, you depreciate that over a 30-year period to $100,000, all right? So you're getting an income tax deduction every year of about $13,000. So what happens is over the period of 30 years, you're deducting th about $13,000 from your income in this example, and you, you pay less income tax from 1990 to 2020. When you sell the property, those cows come home, right? So those cows or the chickens return to the roost and you're gonna have a, a tax bill that's, that's due. Now, this is very important. The, the planning opportunities that I'm talking about here, many of them are only available if you seek expert advice before making any move uh, to sell the property. It shouldn't be more, it should be moved. Any move to sell the property. There's something called the step transaction doctrine. And what that means is if you do a bunch of things um, and, and put together, they constitute one transaction, it kind of blows up in your face. California is very aggressive on this. If you're going to do these strategies, you absolutely have to talk to a savvy expert before you start the sales prop, before you list the property. Once you formulate the thought of, hey, I might want to sell this, that's when you need to talk to an expert. Typically, you start with the lawyer and the CPA working together. You talk with the CPA to quantify your tax bill. You talk with the lawyer uh, for your tax planning strategies. Now, one way of deferring tax, this is not a charitable strategy, but one way that a seller can defer tax is a like-for-like -like business property exchange under 1031 of the Internal Revenue Code. And what this means is um, the owners of this property, they can transfer this, the um, fourplex to a single family residence. They can sell this property and buy a single family residence. They can sell this fourplex and buy a commercial or industrial property. Those are like for like, even though one is a fourplex and the other one's a single family residence. The point here is you don't have to sell a fourplex and buy another fourplex. So it's business property, rental property. A 1031 requires a qualified intermediary. And I want to warn you, qualified intermediaries are absolutely 100% unregulated. There is no regulation on qualified intermediaries. They do go belly up. People do steal your money. You absolutely want to seek out a reputable, solid, qualified intermediary. 
And um, you know, many of the title companies have a qualified intermediary. One of the largest qualified intermediaries is based here in Northern California uh, with over a billion dollars in money that they're holding on to people. So, uh, but you can just hang out your shingle and say, yeah, I'm a qualified intermediary and start taking people's money. And they have, you know, they have embezzled, they have gone belly up. So you really do need to pay attention to that. All right, so the pros and cons of a 1031 exchange, you can defer the tax. Um, you can actually increase leverage. So if you sell a property for 2 million and buy another property for 4 million and take on debt, you can actually get more basis in the property and start um, depreciating the property again. And so that can save you taxes. Uh, the cons though, you're still dealing with tenants, leaky faucets, plugged up toilets, and loss of Prop 13 tax base. And for a lot of clients, this is a really big deal. Um, we've been really focused on the last few weeks since passage of Prop 19, something you need to understand. There, the, the parents' Prop 13 tax base, in many instances, can be passed to the children. That is going away effective February 16 of 2019, uh, 2020. So February 16 of 2021, rather. February 16 of 2021, that is going away. And so many of our clients are reaching out to us. They go to our website and they book an appointment to talk about Prop 19 and, and to save Prop 13 for their kids. And um, this is a very important property, right? Because many people, you know, that $2 million apartment building we gave uh, the example of, those property taxes might be, you know, eight, eight 9,000 a year. If the kid inherits that $2 million property, they may go from eight or 9,000 a year to 24,000 a year. So it's very important to, to pay attention to this. If you're going to leave your property to your kids, I would highly encourage you to reach out to us and, um, and look, about, look into saving your Prop 13 before it goes away, February 16 of 2021. So the verdict on this, the 1031, you know, it's good for some people, not for all people. So it's just something to think about. Uh, we do have a December 17th webinar coming up. Uh, how to sell real estate without paying tax. And that's Prop 19, the 1031 exchange and more. Go to Cunningham Legal to register for that on our webinar page. Uh, and we do have a webinar that is what you need to know about 1031 exchanges. And that is on our YouTube page. That's that little red, um, the little red icon there at the lower, lower right-hand corner. So let's take a concrete example. I've kind of gone over what the problem is, the tax problem. Let's look at some solutions. We have Bob and Sue they set up a charitable trust. And we're gonna go through different iterations or different variations of a charitable trust. But on a high level, Bob and Sue set up a charitable trust. Bob and Sue are 70 years old. They transfer the property to the trust. They then contact a realtor to sell the property. You don't contact the realtor and list the property and then do your charitable trust. That gets you messed up with the step transaction doctrine. You really do need, once Bob and Sue formulated the idea, you know, I might want to sell this property. That's when they need to talk to their lawyer and their CPA and the, and the four of them get together and then they kind of work through the issues. And we do that um, pretty much on a weekly basis with clients. We're meeting with the clients and their CPAs and we're going over um, strategies to avoid or delay payment of tax. So, the property goes into the, the charitable trust. This is not a living trust, it's an irrevocable trust. They sell the property for $2 million. And this is very important. That $700,000 tax bill we talked about, there's no $700,000 tax bill the year of sale. This is a charitable trust. Charitable trusts don't pay taxes when they sell property, All right? So it's very, very important to understand there are some ways to avoid paying the tax or at least delay paying the tax. So here's basically a charitable, remainder unit trust, okay? A lot of words in there, charitable remainder unit trust. The bottom line, here's what happens. I'm gonna walk you through this. It's really not that complicated. So Bob and Sue create this charitable remainder unit trust. That is the big circle. They transfer by deed the property into the charitable trust. And that's Bob and Sue there on the left, that happy couple. They're so happy, they're finally selling that rental property with the leaky toilets and the tenants who don't pay the rent. And they're gonna go, vacation. Once COVID's over, they're going to go to Hawaii. They're going to go wherever they want to go uh, and, uh, and live their best life. So Bob and Sue create the charitable trust. They transfer the fourplex, the fourplex into the charitable remainder unit trust. The charitable remainder unit trust sells the property to Betty, the fourplex uh, to Betty for $2 million. And she's on the right. She's happy. Look, she's becoming a real estate investor. She's creating multi-generational wealth for her family. She's super excited, everyone's happy. $2 million goes into the crut and the taxes aren't paid. So now what happens? You have this charitable trust, 
You've got two million bucks in there. What happens? Well, the way a charitable remainder unit trust works, and it's a big word. There's an acronym CRUT. These are horrible acronyms. Uh, it sounds like something that you know. Oh man, I stepped in some CRUT. It's on the bottom of my shoe. But here's the bottom line. This $2 million is going to be paid out on a percentage basis to Bob and Sue for their lifetime. Now, they've chosen a 5% payout. A 5% payout is the minimum payout by statute. And this statute uh, was passed in 1969. Uh, it's been around forever. And uh, this is solid law. There's no, you know, because people will say, well, is this something that the IRS can challenge? If you do it right and follow the rules, I mean, there's really nothing to challenge because it's actually in the Internal Revenue Code, right? So Bob and Sue put this um, property into the trust. They sell it. Now they have a pot of money and they take 5% a year for life. Now, a charitable remainder unit trust is different than another trust we're going to talk about in that um, if they take an annual payment, the property is valued every year. So whenever that payment comes out, if the, if the value of the trust is $2 million, they're going to get $100,000. If the value goes up to $2.2 million, they're going to get $110,000. If the value goes down to $1.8 million, they're going to get $90,000. All right, let me say that again. This changes every year because the value of the trust will change. A charitable remainder unit trust has a varying or a variable payment structure. So if the, if the investments return 10% and Bob and Sue take out 5%, right? Then that corpus, that 2 million grows by 5%. And so their payout is bigger, uh, hopefully the next year. But if their investment return is zero or negative, then they're gonna get a smaller payment the next year. And so uh, this is something that it kind of goes up and it goes down. Now, what other benefits do Bob and Sue get? So the, these benefits are dependent on a published uh, rates by the Internal Revenue Service, they calculate the value of the remainder. So Bob and Sue get this payment for life. And then when they pass away, it goes to charity and their kids don't get it. We'll talk about that in the next slide. But here, Bob and Sue receive an income tax deduction of 548000 Now that helps to offset uh, the taxes that they'll have to pay because they will pay taxes. As these payments come out, they will pay over time their recapture of depreciation, their net investment income tax, their capital gains tax, the income tax on the return of the charitable trust. But the point is, they're not paying the $700,000 all at once. That $700,000 that would have otherwise been paid to the government, that $700,000 stays in the trust and generates a return for them. And frankly, that's the biggest, most powerful tool uh, of this charitable remainder unit trust is that the taxes are not paid immediately uh, but they are delayed and you can use that wealth that would have otherwise been paid in tax. You can use that wealth uh, for an in income stream. And of course, this 30 and 60% deduction, they would likely on this one get mostly a 30% deduction uh, because this is what we call basis gift. Um, so if they make a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, 300,000 a year, they're going to be able to deduct a hundred. Uh, and this does carry forward for five years. So this is why it's really important to engage an expert, do some forecasting, see if it's for you. Um, and, uh, and there's some other strategies we can incorporate in as well that we'll talk about. So the charitable remainder unit trust, when Bob and Sue die in our hypothetical, there is a $1.6 million in the trust. That goes to charity when Bob and Sue die. That money does not go to the children. And so if Bob and Sue said, well, you know, we don't really like that. We want to leave something for our kids. Bob and Sue can buy life insurance with part of the $100,000 that they get. They can buy life insurance. So they take, you know, maybe they take 50,000 and put that in their pocket and the other 50,000, they buy a life insurance policy so that when they die and that income stream stops. So when they die and that 1.6 million goes to charity, their kids do get an inheritance. They do get some money. Uh, that's also known as a wealth replacement trust. Now let's look at a charitable lead annuity trust. Now this is slightly different. So you'll notice two things. Remainder has been switched to lead and unit trust has been switched to annuity. And before you go, oh my gosh, this guy is speaking like Italian or something. I don't even understand what he's talking about. It's really not that hard. I'm going to walk you through it. So just, just relax. A charitable lead annuity trust. Bob and Sue, they set up their CLAT. 
Remember there was a CRUT and now there's a CLAT, a charitable lead annuity trust. Bob and Sue set up this charitable lead annuity trust and they transfer by deed their $2 million fourplex into the charitable lead annuity trust. They then sell the same apartment to the same buyer, Betty. She's happy. She's building multi-generational wealth through investing in real estate with her family. Everyone's happy. $2 million goes into the CLAT. Zero tax is paid, right? But here's what happens. Instead of the money going to Bob and Sue, the money goes to a charity for 20 years. $100,000, and this one's a fixed payment. It will be $100,000 a year for 20 years. At the end of 20 years, Bob and Sue, or if they passed away their children, they get what's left over. So let's look at what's going on here. So Bob and Sue receive a $1.9 million income tax deduction. Folks, that is a huge income tax deduction. They receive a $1.9 million charitable income tax deduction. Now they can't use it all because it's basis. So they can, use, they can deduct up to 30% of their income uh, and then they can carry this forward. So many of our wealthier clients who say, you know, I'm supporting charity anyway, instead of selling that building and pay taxes and, and writing a check to charity for $100,000 every year, I might as well do this with the fourplex. That makes sense, right? Less money is going to the government. Makes sense, right? And so Bob and Sue with the charitable remainder annuity trust, what the charitable remainder annuity trust is where Bob and Sue get the money. So the remainder, when we talk about a lead and remainder, the lead gift and the remainder gift, that's, that talks about the charity. That talks about when the charity gets the money. So a charitable remainder annuity trust, Bob and Sue get $100,000 a year for 20 years. And um, the charity gets 1.6 million at Bob and Sue's death. But this is a fixed payment for a period of 20 years, not their lifetime, but for 20 years. And again, the children receive nothing. Bob, again, Bob and Sue can buy a policy of life insurance uh, with part of the, the income and so the children get money at their death. That Again, that's that wealth replacement trust. So that's a charitable remainder annuity trust. But the cool thing is, guess what? You can use both, right? That's kind of interesting, isn't it? You can take one strategy and mix it with another strategy. It's kind of like a bean and cheese burrito. If you're like, I like bean burritos and I like uh, beef burritos, a beef and bean burrito, right? You put them together and you have this new thing. They are two separate trusts, okay? It's a 50-50 combo. So half of the fourplex goes into a CRUT, half of the fourplex goes into a CLAT, charitable remainder unit trust, charitable lead annuity trust, Bob and Sue get 50,000 a year in income, the charity gets 50,000 a year in income, and Bob and Sue might've been given 50,000 a year to the charity anyway, right? Bob and Sue get a $1.23 million charitable deduction. That's pretty cool, right? And they can carry that forward five years. The kids also get an inheritance without Bob and Sue having to buy life insurance. So they will get about $800,000. So that's a combination strategy. Many of our clients employ a combination strategy. Other methods of gifting to charity. So we're gonna move off of charitable trusts. You can give your required minimum distribution. Now for 2020, there is no required minimum distribution because of the CARES Act. Uh, you can do what's called a gift annuity. We'll go through that. And gifts of stock. We'll walk you through um, ways to give to charity that are more tax uh, advantageous. So gift of an RMD to charity. So if your income, this, and this is really important, if your income is greater than $174,000 a year and you're married filing jointly, you do pay higher premiums for your Part B Medicare um, coverage and your prescription drug coverage. With, for other single filers, the limit's only $87,000. Now here's the deal. When you take an RMD, many of our clients have very large IRAs. And once they hit 72 now, remember it used to be 70 and a half, but with CARES at 72, once you hit 72, many of our clients are adding $100,000 a year to their income. Boom, your income goes up $100,000. Your Part B Medicare premium is going crazy, right? You're paying thousands of dollars a year more for your Part B Medicare premium. There is a better way. Uh, you can direct that your RMD, your required minimum distribution, be distributed from the IRA custodian directly to the charity, okay? Now, in my experience, Larger religious organizations, larger charities, they have this set up. The smaller ones, not so much. Even larger religious organizations many times don't have this set up. So if that's something that they don't have, I would call the financial office and say, hey, I've watched Jim Cunningham on this webinar and I wanna give my RMD to charity. Can you figure out how to do that? 
Um, and you know, if they don't have it set up, hopefully they will set it up because what you can do is you can make a gift and instead of your RMD going to you and then you turning around and making a gift because that raises your adjusted gross income, right? You're, by giving that directly to the charity, that may keep you from hitting that 174000 or $87,000 level. So this is just a strategy. Again, this is effective charitable giving for those people who say, yeah, I want to continue giving to charity um, and who have a big IRA, uh, certainly take a look at this. Uh, a gift annuity. Now, what is a gift annuity? So we're going to walk through this three steps. There's a donor, the person who makes the gift, and they give assets to a charity. And the donor gets an income stream back. Typically, you, when the donor makes a gift of, let's say, $100,000, that $50,000 is carved out as coming back over the donor's lifetime as a stream of income, and the other 50% goes to the charity. That's kind of how it works out. So you might have seen these, um, uh, these sample gift annuity rates on your lower left hand or lower right hand side of the screen. An 80 year old gets a 7.2% income stream. There's no way you're getting that on a CD, right? So you give them $100,000 and you get 7,200 a year. Uh, but when you die, you don't, there's nothing left, right? That everything, whatever's left in there goes to the charity. So Bob and Sue put $2 million into a gift annuity. They receive $107,000 for life. Not bad. And at the death, at death, whatever's left over goes to charity. That's a little bit more economical way. Uh, less control. You're locked into who the charity is. Um, but, uh, but that is a method. And that is essentially a gift annuity. So you give a chunk of money to a charity and you get income in return. So here's a gift of stock. So here's why sometimes stock is better than cash. And just bear with me on this. If Bob and Sue buy $1,000 worth of Amazon. Now what's happened to Amazon stock? It's gone through the roof, right? Now it's worth $11,000. If they donate the stock for $11,000 to charity, <clears throat> Bob and Sue can turn around and buy $11,000 in Amazon stock. Bob and Sue now have $11,000 in Amazon stock with a basis of $11,000 instead of $1,000 and the charity has $11,000. So this, in, this is a way of increasing your cost basis. If you are charitably inclined anyway, this is not subject to the wash sale rules, the transactions within 30 days. If you give those shares of Amazon, you can like that day, instead of giving $11,000 to a charity, you can give $11,000 of Amazon and turn around that day and buy Amazon stock back. And it's a way of managing the basis on your assets. Can a gift annuity be used for an RMD? Um, I don't, I don't know. That's a really good question. I've never thought of that. Um, I would say probably not because the charitable deduction, the, the, this is a specific carve out in the internal revenue code where you're gifting your RMD. Uh, it's possible though. I don't know. That's a great question. I would ask whatever charity, um, the people who do gift annuities, if you're looking at a gift annuity, say, Hey, can I do this with my RMD? Um, but that's a really good question. So, the idea here is this increases your cost basis in your stock. So when they sell that stock, eventually they're saving money on taxes, right? So action items before making any move to sell an asset. If you're worried about paying tax, seek out expert, uh, seek out expert advice. Sometimes if you do something, you know, you can't pull the cream out of the coffee, right? Uh, sometimes you take these actions and they can't be undone. Check with an attorney first, then the CPA, financial advisor, and realtor. Uh, the reason you check with the attorney first is part of the part of being a lawyer is, is legal counseling. So there's legal advocacy, which is going to court, and legal counseling, which is, hey, is this really what you want to do? If you say, yeah, I like this charitable remainder trust, but I don't want to buy life insurance, and I want my kids to get the asset when I die, go look at the 1031 exchange uh, webinar, right? Because this may not be for you. Um, but go to CunninghamLegal.com, set up a, a time to meet by Zoom or phone. Please specify whether you are meeting about Prop 19 or you're meeting about charitable giving because those are two different tracks. Um, but go ahead and, and do a brief synopsis of what you want to meet about. Evaluate your options. And this is not, I'm, this is a big warning. This is not a DIY project. This is not a do-it-yourself project. So there's our webinar. Uh, webinar. There's our website. Uh, the book of consultation is the um, is the green up there, or the uh, the orange up there in the upper right hand corner. It's also on the left hand side in blue. 
So again, before selling any asset, seek out expert advice, go to CunninghamLegal.com. We'll open it up for questions. And uh, we have a question from Sally. Hi, Sally, how you doing? Hi, Bo. 85-year-old widow wants to sell home to finance long-term care, but basis to 75,000, the home is worth 1.5 million. Not uncommon in the Bay Area, super common. She's house rich, but cash poor. What are the pros and cons of setting up some form of charitable trust? I was just on the um, email exchange with the California Community Foundation, um, Sally, and there is a method where she can make a gift of her home to charity and live in the property and get a current income tax deduction. It works for vacation homes. It works for residences. Doesn't work so well for uh, commercial property or if there's debt on the property. But that's another one where if she um, wants to sell her home, she can certainly put that home into a charitable trust and get a stream of income. She could also do a gift annuity at 85. If she puts a million five into a gift annuity, you know, she's going to get hundred some thousand dollars a year. That's, that's a lot of money. So, um, but that's a great, uh, a great example. So I'll give it a few more minutes for any questions that come up. And another question comes up from Anonymous. If you gift the Amazon stock of 11,000 to charity, I don't understand why you are allowed to rebuy 11,000 of new stock. Where does this money come from to buy? In this hypothetical, the clients were gonna give $11,000 to charity anyway. Right. So if you uh, attend a religious, um, uh, you know, if you're of a religious faith and you attend services uh, or not, and you want to support those organizations, a lot of people, uh, you know, there's tithing. Sort of in the Christian faith, there's this concept of, of gifting 10% of your net increase per year. So if your income is $100,000, many people believe that they're obligated to, um, to contribute $10,000 to their, to their church. And so um, if you have, 11,000 in Amazon or 10,000 in Amazon stock, you can write a check for 10,000 or you can donate that $10,000 in Amazon stock and turn around and rebuy anyway. This is for people who are already make, gonna make a gift to charity. This is just an efficient way to give to charity. And it looks like we'll give it a couple more seconds. I wanna thank you guys for coming here today and joining me for some charitable strategies. Please check out our website and um, go ahead and set up a time to meet with us and we look forward to meeting with you soon.